Welcome back to the Bob Pritchard Straight Talking Radio Show. Over the last six years or so, we've given you insights into the lives of over 320 of the world's most interesting people. We've spoken about what they do, what makes them tick, how they became known, what pitfalls they encountered along the way and how they overcame them. You know, it's extremely difficult to create a successful business and we need to receive advice and assistance from those people that have achieved success before us. So the aim of this segment is to give you information and to assist you to become successful. Now, Robert Dreesen is both an entrepreneur in a field that very few succeed at. And he's also successful having made many millions of dollars. He's also able to live comfortably in the tropics by the water, although that have not may not have always been entirely by choice. My guest today is Dutch artist Robert Dreesen. Now, Robert's regarded as the most successful art forger and one that the European authorities sought to find and arrest. But while Robert's German accomplices sat in prison, he was free until he was finally arrested and convicted. The police sought him in Europe for art crimes. Robert Dreesen forged some thousand paintings by various artists and 1,300 sculptures by the Swiss sculptor Alberto Giacometti, despite the fact that Giacometti produced no more than 500 uh, unique pieces. So the the artist only produced 500 pieces, but Robert produced 1,300. Now, at one stage, two of his accomplices were in prison in Germany, and Robert was the only member of the gang still at large. He was eventually captured, convicted and sentenced to prison. Now, Robert spent more than 30 years forging art, including paintings and sculptures. And he's lived pretty well on the proceeds. We found him and he's running a small cafe in Thailand. And uh, Robert Abramovich, who's the owner of... Chelsea Football Club. Luxury yacht is anchored nearby, so he's living in a pretty nice part of the world. Robert, welcome to the Bob Pritchard Radio Show, and you're being heard all around the world. Thank you very much for having me. you certainly had a hell of an interesting life, haven't you? Well, some people say yes. Uh, I would agree with them, but uh, on the other hand, it was uh, stressful forging sculptures, trying to get out of the hands of the justice departments, which finally they won, and they put me to jail for forging the sculptures by Giacometti. So what is it that drives a forger, a forger, whether it be art or sculpture or whatever it is? Is it is it the money? Is it the thrill of the chase? Is it outsmarting the so-called art experts or the authorities, or is it something else or a combination of all of those things? Well, let's say it's a combination of all, but uh, outsmarting the the experts who think they know it all makes me, well, yeah, thrills. If you make something, people can't say this is made by the original artist or made by somebody who hasn't got a clue, actually, but just doing it. And, yeah, that's actually my goal. It's not so much the money, because that everybody says I've made four tunes. I did it. I did, I did quite well, I must admit. But, uh, no, uh, the, 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 my main goal was, yeah, forging is, yeah, my passion. Yeah. Art is my passion. And I want to do forges and make it actually better than the uh, actual artist did. So how do you determine what piece of art or what type of artist you're going to forge? Do you, is that um, related to 
your own style or can you forge any style? I can forge any style and people come to me just because of that. And they say, Robert, can you make me this or that? And that's what happened with Giacometti as well. People came to me and wanted a Giacometti. I said, well, the biggest one Giacometti made was not even three meters. I'll make you a bigger one, a nicer one, which I did. And successfully sold it. So, and that's. But most of the art that um, you forged, whether uh, uh, speaking of art being either paintings or sculpture, um, was was most of that made to order? I mean, did somebody come to you and say, yes. "Look, I've got a great private yes. collection, and I want to." So, people, how does so, so how does so? I'm an art collector, and I'm. Got, got some pieces together. How do I find a forger? I mean, you can't look you up in the phone book. How do I find a forger? Well, it's mouth to mouth. People know other people and they say, well, if you want this or that, then uh, call this Robert. Is... And that's his number. <laughs> that's, how it's, that, that's how it went in my case. That's, uh, but I've I, I worked for many, many people. And, uh, sure. It's not only the Giacometti's. On a, on, a, on a rainy Sunday when it's nothing to do, I, I, I take a book by any famous artist. And at one stage, I made a hundred Emil Nolder, one of the most nicest German artists, uh, and uh, made a hundred watercolors in a, on, on, on a rainy weekend. <laughs> so, okay, another question: If if people all around the world can find you and commission you to forge a painting or a piece of sculpture, why couldn't the authorities find you? I haven't got a clue, actually. I mean, apart- Everybody knew I was in Thailand. Everybody knew I was in Thailand, and nobody came to get me. So were you sort of looking over your shoulder the whole time, every morning waking up to the- Ugh. Not really. That would be too. That would have been too stressful. But uh, yes, of course. You, 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 in the back of your head, you always know somebody's coming out and get you. But then Thailand's pretty safe because they don't uh, extradite uh, for like why well, I wouldn't say petty crime. But uh, in my case, I think uh, forging art is not really, really. Uh, uh, criminal fact and uh, that's why they left me alone for that long <laughs> so I had to go to Holland myself to, to get arrested yeah why did you do that well uh, I got a son there I've got an ex-wife there and we sometimes miss things in Holland or wherever and then yes it just went so you went you and went... I, I thought it was I thought it was too long ago to, to, to well so I thought that it, the other two were already convicted and had, did their time, and I thought, well, I'm safe now. But I was wrong. You know, they have they have things safe. at the airport when you go through that says who you are. And were you travelling under your own name, or would you have a? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So you weren't trying to hide. Yeah. You were actually asking. To get no. <laughs> yes, actually, I actually did. <laughs> and then this huge sentence came, and uh, I thought, well, if they would arrest me, they'd uh, say, don't do this again, man. But uh, I was wrong. <laughs> Didn't work that way. Okay, so you began, when you when you were young, you began painting your own art. And, um, yes. When did didn't you, sell. <laughs> so, yeah, when did you go from painting your own um, product and uh, trying to develop your way as an artist... Uh, when did you turn to copying famous artists to forging other people's art? There, were, there was a German art auctioneer that came and said, I need some Dutch or German oil paintings, like uh, in, in, in the Romantic style, the 1850s, uh, summer scenes, winter scenes. Could you do that? I said, yes, well, of course. And uh, he said, oh, please, I'll give you 25 guilders for uh, any painting you make. So that's what I did. I was 19 years old at that, at that time. So that's when I first uh, imitated uh, other artists, actually. So if you're um, 
I don't know much about um, the composition of art, but if you're if you're forging something that's 150 years old or whatever, you have to take into account the um, the the canvas on which you you're painting it and the sort of inks you use and how do you how do you if you want to do it perfect yeah if you want to do it perfect yes well you you, you you buy an old old old, uh, old old canvases and remove the paint that's on there and uh, start painting anew so where do you get the where do you get the paint that it, uh, I would imagine that like everything there's been big advantages in paint over the last few hundred years or whatever how do you how do you yeah. re- replicate the paint that was or the oil or whatever it was that was used back in those days well many of the oil paint uh, is still the same but there are some particular white colors and uh, that weren't available that that, that, that were different at the, at, in those times but you can make, you can easily make them yourself that's not so good Right, so it, it's not only just being a great artist, it's being smart enough to determine the materials you've got to use so that you ideally don't get caught. Yes, and that's the same with uh, with, with sculptures, of course, and, and sculptures is even more difficult to see because it's, uh, it's you know, bronze is, if you have a bronze from today or a bronze from 10,000 years ago, it's, it's, still, it's still bronze. Right. And it's hard to find out uh, what, what 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 age it has. Yeah, that makes it easier for you, doesn't it? Yes, and as long as you do the pattern, uh, the patina on it, which is uh, which is also an ancient art, uh, and if you do that right with this, with several assets, then uh, it's it's very hard to discover. So, where did you learn to paint? Was that just a natural talent, or did you? Yes, I think so. Yes, everybody. When I was young, everybody said, "Oh, wow, you can you can really you can make really nice things." And yeah, well, and then I went to art school for a year, which which was pretty boring. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that just started from there. Actually. So, what about um, sculptor? Is that a, is that a, a, another art that you just picked up, or did you have some? Yeah, I I, I, I once I once I bought. Uh, a pack of clay, and uh, and I saw a nice torso of uh, Aristide Mayol, a French uh, artist, and I thought, well, let's see if I can make that. <laughs> and yeah, well, uh, half an hour later, it was there. <laughs> now you so. you've just released a book, which I assume is self-published, yes. is it? It's published. Uh, it was published last last week. Yes, now, and last week. My my language abilities are not great, but is it called uh, Lieberfrau L? Is that what it? Yes, it's uh, it's it, in English. It's it, it would have been uh, said, uh, dear Mrs. L. Yeah, I looked. I actually looked it up on Google, and it says in English it means Lady L. And I was wondering whether that Lady L stood for Lady Luck. No, 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 no. No, it's 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 it's. Uh, it was a woman that once asked me, do you have any regret or do you feel sorry or do you, would you, would you have done it different? And that's the, that's why the title is Leave for L because she asked that I wrote the book. So my book is actually, I'm talking to her and explained what I did and did not and why I don't have regret of most things, of course, there are always regrets. And that's what I explain in the book. Yeah. Um, I find a couple of things interesting and I, um, um, I have trouble sort of rec- reconciling it. So I just want to run through. In the book, you claim that you're a victim um, because the auction houses made tens of millions of dollars compared with what you made. <laughs> but yes. you... How can you be a victim when you knew you were forging? You knew you were fooling museums and galleries and major auction houses. Um, yes, it, but there's a, there's a slight difference. If, <laughs> yeah, if, okay. If, if you if you if you if you if you sell a work of art for let's say a thousand dollars, 
yeah. which is worth 10 million. Yeah. I don't really think that's fraudulent. Oh. What people do with it, with what people do with it, bring it to auction houses and sell it for a lot of money. Yes, well, but, but, <laughs> I've done my job. I've got my money. Okay, but at the same Sorry? time, you knew when you forged something and you supplied yes. it to an auction house or whatever, you knew what they were going to do with it. And you you know, you yes. obviously knew that they were selling it for whatever, <laughs> whatever millions of dollars they could flog it for. Um Surely, at, at at very least, you're guilty, aren't you, of being a forger? But certainly, wouldn't be a victim in my my view. I, I I don't say I'm a victim, but I'm not that. Uh, you're not a real bad as guy. People as as, as no, as people <laughs> say I am. Okay. I That's... think I think many people would 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 should, should take their responsibility if they buy something like a Ferrari, you can't buy a Ferrari for a thousand dollars, can you? One wouldn't think so. Um, but no. if let, let's look at um, Giacometti's, you know, Giacometti in his life apparently produced about 500 pieces of work and you produced about 1300 pieces of his work um, and you were brazen enough to make your own models and then cast them and stamp them with the stamps of the foundries that Giacometti had used. Now, that's surely that's an obvious attempt to deceive, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, how do you, but, how but, do you but, justify but, that? Giacometti, Gia, Giacometti's an artist and I make art. Okay. That's, that's the difference, I think. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, you also on your on your website you more or less brag about being one of the world's most famous forgers. Um, That's what they call me. I never yeah. said that myself, but uh, but you believe it, don't you? I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the well most well, most known well, most well known uh, forgers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are much better ones. Yeah, but I'm not too bad. <laughs> I think deep down you probably think, you know, I'm really fucking good at this. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay. You talk in the book about the sentence, the pre-justice system and life behind bars. Before we discuss the art world in general, would you like to sort of elaborate on a couple of those points, the sentence, the pre-justice system and life behind bars? Um, because for most of the, the listeners, they wouldn't be familiar with the uh, German system. Well, I, I call it pre-justice because before, uh, every, everything was already settled. Everybody was going to know Everybody knew I was I was I was I was I was guilty, and they gave me. Uh, uh, but there was one thing that they, they said it was a gang, and for a gang you need more than one, more than two, three people. The only thing, the only one um, I dealt with was this man who got seven and a half year sentence, and uh, that was that was the only one uh, I dealt with, and, and 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 they would say it was a gang, but it wasn't. And that was most of the sentence. Right, well, would, what about the people that the, your immediate contact was commissioned by? Presumably he was sitting there and he had these art gallery or art auctions who would come to him and say, Psst, can you get me whatever? And uh, he'd say, okay, I'll get on to Robert and, you know, give me a couple of weeks and you'll have <laughs> you'll have your Picasso or whatever. Um Mm -hmm. Surely that that makes it much bigger than just two of you, doesn't it? Wouldn't that qualify as a um, gang? Mm, well, well, it, it depends on how you see it. I, I think I, I dealt with just one man. Uh, what this man with, with with whom he dealt uh, that's beyond my 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 thing. Okay, um, for somebody who's artistic and creative 
what was life like behind bars? Did you? I guess they didn't give you a paintbrush and a canvas. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I made fifty more Giacometti drawings in jail. So, but uh, I had to, I had to buy my own uh, uh, pencils and things. Yes, so, I didn't get it from the state. <laughs> so you actually sat in so, jail. Um, creating more forgeries that you could <laughs> you could um, cast when you got out. No, I just made painting. I just made uh, drawings. Uh, this is a shame, actually, because uh, I, I like sculpting more. But uh, they didn't. They wouldn't give me any of these materials. <laughs> yeah. I can't say that I really. But I didn't blame them. <laughs> I didn't put in uh, Giacometti's name, though. Right. Okay. Um, in your book, you say that it's not the art that sells, but the story. What do you mean by the yes. story? Well, if you've ever been to an art gallery, and uh, of course there's nice things there, but uh, there's always somebody talking about it as if it was the most beautiful, beautiful thing in the world. And that's why I say the more beautiful the story, the higher the price. It's the way of selling it, not the piece of art uh, directly. I, I explain in my book that there's a, you can make an artist. You can, you can, you can, you can buy his stuff for a couple of bob and uh, put it in an art gallery, uh, put red stickers on it and do that for a couple of, couple of years and make that artist great, big, expensive. And, and, and then somebody will write about it. And then that's what, that's like what, what happened with Tiffany Lambs for Barbara Streisand and Teddy Bears, Michael Jackson. That's, you, you could, you, it depends on who buys it that makes the prices. So are you saying that art isn't judged on the quality of the art? Well, that's very subjective anyway, isn't it? Um, yes, but indeed. It's, um, it's judged on how much exposure and, and promotion from the right people determines whether or not that art becomes... I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an absolute believer in that, yes. You know, it's interesting because three or four days ago when I was in Spain, I went to the Picasso Museum and, you know, there's a hell of a lot of good stuff there, but there's a hell of a lot of stuff that I reckon I could have painted. Um, well, <laughs> probably not, but you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So what, what – Picasso led a fairly – you know, he wasn't – that well Huge. connected Huge. initially, so he didn't have the connections to go out and promote in the, in the real early days. In fact, I think the stuff that he did when he was 17, 18, 19 was the best work he did. But um, absolutely. So, how does somebody who's unknown become that famous if it's all well, just a matter of Picasso, manipulation? Yes, for Picasso was even because he was a he, he worked hard. He made a, an awful lot of work. Yeah, true. And that's what, uh, of course, uh, these gallerist people want because the more the merrier. And um, that's what I say at the beginning. They'll uh, they'll buy his stuff because he needs money, of course, and uh, put it on the gallery, uh, get in the press. Uh, put red stickers and do that for several times. And then at a certain point, it'll sell itself. And with Picasso, because he made so much, so many things, and uh, that, that that was easy, actually. What Did you actually think at the time, well, um, I'm pretty good at this and, and I'm creating forgeries that are selling, that um, you would paint your own... Uh, works or sculpt your own works alongside the stuff that you were selling. Um, I didn't have time for that. <laughs> you were too busy forging stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, how many, okay, that, that's interesting. If you, if you, how long were you forging? I mean, how many years were you creating forgeries? Probably 40, 
probably 40 years, something. So, and you could, you would have churned out several thousand pieces in that time, right? Yes. So how many people are out there churning out several thousands of pieces of forged art and f- putting that art on the market? Is there, a, is there a whole bunch of you? Is there a dozen? Is there a hundred? Is there a thousand? How many people are out there forging art? You're coming closer. You're coming closer with the last number. So you think there's thousands of forgers out there putting art on the market that isn't genuine? Yes. But that happened for thousands of years already, of course. But uh, the, the last hundred years, it's, uh, it's become more and more and more, of course. So how, do you, how does one detect whether a piece of art is genuine or just some clever bastard like you has gone and painted it? How do you... How do you how does the collector tell? It, it, it's, it's very, 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 very difficult. And I always say to people, if you like a work of art, and if they ask, uh, I don't, it don't really matter. It doesn't really matter what price. If you're, if you're happy with the price they ask, put it on your wall. But don't instantly look at the name that's uh, uh, under it. But uh, it's, do you like it? Don't you? And that's that's what the prices are based on, I think. And people do so difficult about art. And the, it's a shame, really. The majority of people... Art should be for everybody. Yeah, but the majority of people who buy name art do it for... as a collector and for... Reasons. That, yeah, for yeah. Um, investment reasons. So how do they tell whether something is genuine or not? And I guess... Does it matter? Well, providence, of course. Providence. Uh, if you, how far can you back? Uh, how, far, how far can you go back for with providence? Uh, to providence, and uh, that's always a, a thing you should uh, keep in mind. How okay. Providence. Well, you were supplying forgeries to auction houses, and they were selling them sometimes for huge amounts of money. How did they cover the provenance situation? Or did they just um, find people they, they, who didn't care? They, they, didn't, they, didn't really, they didn't really care. So you've just they got to find really them. If you, well, if you, if, if you go, if you come with Picasso or with Giacometti or uh, Andy Warhol or whatever, these huge, these big, big, big names, of course, they, 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 they would not uh, sell it without a provenance. But, but you were, you were everything, mu- everything minor than that. Uh, they don't really care. For but you were selling they heaps think, of Jacobettis, you know, weren't you? Yes, but I, I never sold them at auctions. I no, sold them to, to this one to this one man. And then he he that went on and sold. No, he didn't. He didn't. He, he didn't. He didn't sell it to auctions, as far as I know. No. Uh, he didn't sell it at auctions also. Okay, so you're saying that people like Sotheby's and Christie's don't bother to check provenance, but they're only interested in selling the art. So, yes, do they work together? Do they work together? Or are they totally independent, or have they got a sort of a wink, wink, nod, nod, nod understanding that um, you know they'll? Well, every major, every major city in the world has a Sotheby's and the Christie's. I, I, I think that. They uh, work together a bit, but sometimes not. But there was because there was two authentic Renoirs a couple of years uh, back, uh, one in London and one in uh, in New York. Right, it suddenly came on the market because if they um, if they sell fakes and, and it becomes known, then it screws up their reputation, doesn't it? Happened many times before already. Yes, and they just get by it. For myself, I, I know that at least 200 sculptures I made were sold there. So. <laughs> um, the guy that was your point man who was um, buying the sculptures and things off you, what happened to him? He went to jail for seven years? Uh, he, he was in jail half, half time, same as me. Seems and he a- went to Portugal. Okay, is he still in the art after, business? After a sentence. 
I haven't got a clue. I, 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 I didn't I didn't talk to him ever since. Okay, you're you're a fascinating guy with a fantastic story to tell. Um, what do you, you do now? You're still producing art. Uh, well, I just finished my book, so uh, I'm, I'm still looking what to do now. Uh, I, I, I do. I'm, I'm going to write a new book, but uh, that'll take uh, that'll take me more time because uh, I'm not in a hurry anymore. I want to do this. Uh, I want to do this book, Leave for L, pretty quick, and I succeeded. And now I'm uh, writing another one. And by if people come to me and say, "Can you make me this or that?" Um, of course, I'm open to that. So, and you're producing work under your own name now that I, I see. Yes, sir. So is that, do they all look like um, traditional artists or are they your own flavour? Oh, if people can do a, a mixture between, if, if you want. Uh, I just made um, a, a Banksy. Uh, I sprayed a Banksy and uh, a Keith Herring, and I put under it uh, Banksy meets Herring. So <laughs> that's what I do as well. <laughs> so you you distinguish your art now using your own name, yes, rather than whoever you are forging. So yeah, that's too much trouble. The fact that you're and there's too many people know where the hell you are now since they caught you once. So, where do, does your name have a value now? I mean, if if somebody sees a piece of work by Robert Dresson, um, has that got an intrinsic value because you are famous and you are who you are? I, I, I did. I didn't increase the prices yet. I might in <laughs> at one stage, maybe, but uh, it's getting too busy. But no, I still enjoy it very, very much, and I do my best. And I, I was what I did before. Also, I, I, I judge the piece on my work, on the hours I spend, and that's how I made my price always. Okay, so what's next for Robert Dresson? Write my new book about. Yeah. I went to England, South of England, seven years, every weekend to the auction houses. And there's some very funny and nice stories about that. And uh, alongside, I do some artwork. I hope you've got a good lawyer because it seems to me that you put out a book of your stories, um, the um, Sotheby's and Christie's and people like that are going to sue the hell out of you. Oh, well, the, 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 truth, the truth never harms, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truth's no defence, though, is it? <laughs> well, I can prove it all. So uh, if they want to sue me, come on, get me. Okay, so um, thank you very much for speaking with me on the Bob Pritchard Radio Show. I really enjoyed it. And now, a very nice time. You, you can see Robert's work by going to Dress and Art. Now, I'll spell that for you. It's D R. I E S S E N A R T dot com. That's Dreese. I would say Dreesen Art, but it's Dreesen Art dot com. And you can see some of the works that he has for sale. You can read some fascinating information. It's um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Robert. And I'll be back. Thank you very much. With more of the Bob Pritchard Radio Thank Show. You. On Voice America Business Network after this short break. <laughs> 